Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Andrea Gittleman. I'm policy director at the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Today, we are joined by expert speakers to help us launch the 2022 to 23 Early Warning Project Statistical Risk Assessment, which analyzes the risk of new mass killings around the world. We're joined today by several speakers who I will introduce in turn. But first, I'd like to turn to Naomi Kikoler, Director of the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide, for opening remarks. Naomi, over to you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Good morning and welcome. Thank you to our distinguished speakers for their remarks and their expertise, as well as for their support for our early warning project. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum was created to be a living memorial to the victims and survivors of the Holocaust. The Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide within it is dedicated to confronting contemporary genocide and related crimes against humanity by stimulating global preventive action and catalyzing international responses when they occur. To put this in simple terms, our goal is to try to do for communities today what was not done for the Jews during the Holocaust. As a community of conscience, we must act not only when genocide is evident, but also when early warning signs appear. We know that mass killings are not spontaneous and not inevitable. Prevention is not only crucial, but also possible when warning signs are heeded by the international community. As the bipartisan Albright-Cohen Genocide Prevention Task Force concluded more than a decade ago, Effective early warning does not guarantee successful prevention, but if warning is absent, slow, inaccurate, or indistinguishable from the noise of regular reporting, failure is virtually guaranteed. The museum, in partnership with Dartmouth College, developed a quantitative early warning system to identify countries at risk of mass killing. The early warning project uses state-of-the-art methods to assess the risk of mass killing in countries around the world. Today, we're launching the 2022-2023 Statistical Risk Assessment that can help policymakers determine where to devote scarce resources for additional analysis and ultimately preventive action. We should remain vigilant to the risks in these countries now and act before it's too late. One of the Simon Scott Center's goals is to ensure that the U.S. government, other governments, and multilateral organizations have institutional structures, tools, and policies to effectively prevent and respond to genocide and other mass atrocities. The Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocity Prevention Act, the Atrocity Prevention Task Force and its predecessors, and the recent U.S. strategy to anticipate, prevent, and respond to atrocities are important milestones in this effort. But further explicit integration into U.S. national security and foreign policy priorities is urgently needed. This must include, among others, the national security strategies of the United States and the stronger involvement of the U.S. defense and national security sector. Reflecting its important work, the Early Warning Project was included in the Global Fragility Act in 2019 as a source to determine where the U.S. government should prioritize its global fragility strategy, a landmark 10-year effort to improve U.S. action to stabilize conflict-affected areas and prevent extremism and violent conflict. The mentioned U.S. strategy to anticipate, prevent, and respond to atrocities outlines commitments by the U.S. government to conduct these types of assessments on identified priority countries. The more governments and international organizations develop their own early warning tools and processes, the better. We designed our early warning project to catalyze effective preventive action. Preventing genocide is, of course, difficult. In deciding how to respond, policymakers face an array of constraints and competing concerns. We know from the Holocaust what can happen when early warning signs go unheeded. We aim for our risk assessment to serve as a tool and a resource for policymakers and others interested in prevention. We hope this helps them discuss priorities and undertake deeper analysis that can help reveal where preventive action can make the greatest impact in saving lives. Thank you again for joining us today. Great, thank you, Naomi. And as was noted in the chat, uh, please use the Q&A function. It's located on the bottom center of your screen. The questions that you enter will reach the moderator, although they won't appear, appear on the main screen. We'll get to as many questions as possible during our time together. Um, note that the chat function for today is disabled. Um, I would now like to introduce remarks from Representative Young Kim, representing California's 40th Congressional District and the incoming chair of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Indo-Pacific. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Young Kim, representative of California's 40th Congressional District. I'm honored to be with you, uh, even though virtually, 
as the Holocaust Memorial Museum launches the Early Warning Project's latest annual report on countries at risk of mass atrocities. The work you do to educate visitors from all over the world about the Holocaust, share stories of the victims, and prevent future genocides and mass atrocities is so important. I value the work that is done here, and I join you today in committing to defend communities at risk of genocide, something that was not done for the Jewish people of Europe before and during the Holocaust. As a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, protecting fundamental human rights around the world is a top priority of mine in Congress. The Early Warning Project's latest report comes at an important time as we recently observed Holocaust Remembrance Day and have seen anti-Semitism and hate on the rise. I support the work that you all do and will continue to do my part in Congress to raise awareness and ensure never again means never again. Together, I know that we can create a better and safer future. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kim. I'll now introduce remarks from Representative Sarah Jacobs, representing California's 51st Congressional District and member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and House Armed Services Committee. Hi everyone, thank you so much to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide for inviting me to speak on the incredibly important annual statistical risk assessment for mass atrocities. This report is an essential tool for lawmakers to know where we should focus our energy and policies to prevent and respond to genocide and other mass atrocities. I know both personally and professionally how important data like this is. Before Congress, I worked at the State Department, focusing on countering and preventing conflict and violent extremism, and I saw firsthand the devastating impact of violence and conflict on vulnerable populations, cities, and entire regions. And now, through my work on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I'm working to address these root causes of violence and ensure peace, safety, and security for all. Last Congress, I introduced legislation that would review our security assistance with partner countries at the highest risk for atrocities to ensure that our military aid is not inadvertently worsening the risk factors for atrocities and genocide. I'm also pushing for thoughtful implementation of the Global Fragility Act so we can determine where to prioritize U.S. dollars in action to stabilize conflict-affected areas and prevent extremism and violent conflict around the world. As the youngest Jewish member of Congress, I know how important it is to recognize patterns, warning signs, and indicators that lead to violence. We must do more to ensure that never again is a reality. And this annual statistical risk assessment for mass atrocities is a great tool to ensure that we can. So thank you again for all of your work, and I'm so honored to be doing this work alongside you. I would like to introduce remarks from Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, Ann Wachowski. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining this important event. I specifically want to thank our host, the Simon Scott Center at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, for the incredible work its team does to protect communities at risk of atrocities. They are steadfast partners to us and many others. I commend the team that produced the statistical risk assessment being launched today. I speak for the entire U.S. Atrocity Prevention Task Force in noting the value derived from your early warning efforts. The statistical risk assessment is uniquely structured to alert policymakers globally to countries and regions where attention to atrocity risks may be needed. It enables us to better understand and preempt the escalation of risk drivers by mobilizing U.S. atrocity prevention efforts. This valuable tool works hand in hand with another resource recently launched by the Simon Scott Center the Lessons Learned Project. These tools help policymakers quickly understand where we need to act, what tools are available, and what factors to consider in applying those tools. It is precisely this type of analysis that we have come to associate with the Simon Scott Center. The Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations and our partners across the task force regularly draw upon the center's reports, methodological expertise, networks of civil society experts, recommendations, and going forward, this latest statistical risk assessment. As we continue to implement the U.S. strategy to anticipate, prevent, and respond to atrocities, our long-standing partnership with the Center will play a critical role. 
the launch of this assessment, and the many efforts it will inform reflect our shared belief that preventing atrocities is a core national security interest and a core moral responsibility of the United States. Thank you again for your dedication and efforts to advance our shared mission to prevent atrocities. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Wachowski, and thank you all for your patience. Uh, we'll now hear from Dr. Ashley Landau, who is a research associate with the Museum Simon Scott Center. She leads our work on the Early Warning Project, and she will describe the 2022 to 23 statistical risk assessment. Over to you, Ashley. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, I'm honored to be presenting this work on behalf of the rest of the Early Warning Project's analytical team, Lawrence Wucher, the research director of the Simon Scott Center, and Drs. Benjamin Valentino, Chad Hazlitt, Julia Levine, and Vincent Bauer. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the Early Warning Project, give you a quick overview of the methodology of the statistical risk assessment, and then highlight some of the results from this year's assessment. Please feel free to submit your questions as I'm going along. So launched in 2015 in partnership with Dartmouth College, the Early Warning Project uses quantitative and qualitative methods to assess and spotlight the risks of mass atrocities in countries around the world. This is the first publicly available tool of its kind. And the project really has twin goals. First is to improve discussions around the risks of genocide and mass atrocities and the need for prevention. And at the same time, because this is an evolving and emerging field, to try to contribute to the developing science of early warning for mass atrocities. All of our data and the methods are publicly available. One of the key objectives of this work is to be as transparent and open as possible. So we really encourage you to visit our website. And I believe my colleague Kendall has already put a link in the chat to the website. So one of the core components of the Early Warning Project is our statistical risk assessment. And we conduct this annual assessment to help governments, international organizations, and non-governmental organizations really determine where to devote resources for additional analysis, policy attention, and preventative action. And as mentioned by Naomi, we were very pleased to see that the Global Fragility Act cites our risk assessment as a resource for precisely this function. The bill lists our assessment, among others, as a useful input to the selection of priority countries for the United States government. Um, we're pleased that our statistical risk assessment is also being used in a similar way by the Interagency Atrocity Prevention Task Force. So before we discuss how the statistical risk assessment works, it's important to talk about definitions. Our institution's mandate relates to genocide and related crimes against humanity, but to build a statistical model to assess risks, we really need a definition that's really as objective and precise as possible. One that is subject to less judgment or debate among experts. So we use this definition of mass killing which overlaps certainly with the definitions of genocide and related crimes against humanity, but it is distinct. So we consider a mass killing to have occurred when the deliberate actions of a specific armed group, including but not limited to state security forces, rebel armies, other militias, result in the deaths of at least 1,000 non-combatant civilians targeted as a part of a specific group over a period of one year or less. And so there are a few things to note here. Um, first, we're talking about deliberate actions. So we would not be looking at situations where large numbers of civilians die in incidental or accidental ways at the hands of specific armed groups. Second, the numerical threshold here is 1,000 non or more non-combatant civilians. Um, now there's nothing magical about this number, but we do need to use some threshold so that we can clearly identify what counts and what doesn't for our modeling purposes. And this is a fairly conventional threshold within these kinds of projects. Third, we're looking for instances where civilians are targeted as a part of a specific group. Now, our concept of groupness is broader than the genocide convention, but we're excluding situations where there might be high levels of violence 
but they're from unrelated events. And then the last thing that you don't see explicitly in this definition that I want to mention is that for practical reasons about what we are able to forecast reliably, we are only assessing risks of mass killing when both the armed group and the target group are within the same country. So using this model, we're not able to assess risks of what we might call cross-border or international mass killing. So our risk assessment is produced annually, as I mentioned, and we publish it every fall, and it covers a two-year window of time. So this year's assessment looks at the risks in 2022 and 2023. And next fall, we'll publish a list looking at 2023 and 2024 and so on. So the way we do this is we try to be as systematic about it as possible and take advantage of the advances in data availability, statistics, and machine learning. These risk assessments and rankings that we produce are not based on my or anyone else's opinions, but rather by patterns identified by a machine learning model that is learning from the past. So in essence, the model is really asking what countries today look most like countries that have experienced mass killing in the past, really that in that year or two before onset. So the first step in our methodology is that we look back historically and identify episodes of mass killing that would fall under our definition. Then we compile a bunch of publicly available data on things that are plausibly associated with the risk of mass killing. We're only using data from publicly available sources, so we're not making those judgments, but we're drawing on the information from other sources. And the variables that go into our modeling process relate to five broad areas. First, basic country characteristics. So for example, an age of a country or the region it's in. Second, war and conflict. So variables like battle deaths or has the country ever had a history of mass killing. Third, governance. So for example, restrictions on candidates. Fourth, socioeconomic characteristics. So for example, GDP growth per capita. Fourth, human rights and, and, and sorry, fifth, human rights and civil liberties. So for example, freedom of religion and expression or freedom of movement. Then, we feed the data into a machine learning algorithm, which basically looks for patterns in the data and identifies how these potential risk factors are related to the onset of mass killing. Every year we take that algorithm and we apply it to the most recent data and produce a new list of countries ranked by their estimated risk of experiencing a new onset of mass killing. Now, I do want to underscore that the most recent data for this analysis are reflecting the conditions in countries at the end of 2021. There tends to be a time lag before these data are available, and then it takes us a little bit of time, obviously, to produce the results and get to the point of launching. So this year, the results, these results apply to 2022 and 2023 and are based on data up until the end of 2021. There are a couple of things to keep in mind when looking at the results. Uh, the first is it's important to note that our model is forecasting the risk for new mass killing, not the continuation or escalation of ongoing episodes. Second, the model is really great for sorting countries by risk, and in some cases highlighting countries that maybe people don't think of as at risk for mass atrocities, or showing you maybe where risk is increasing. But the model isn't going to tell you exactly what's going on in that country. We see it as a starting point for further analysis. And third, the model is not causal. The variables as identified as predicting higher or lower risk are not necessarily the factors that drive or trigger atrocities. Uh, for example, a large population does not directly cause mass atrocities. However, countries with large populations have been more likely to experience mass killing episodes in the past. So this factor helps us identify countries at greater risk going forward. Okay, so this is one way of visualizing the results from our latest assessment. 
they, these are the top 30 countries with the highest risk of a new onset of mass killing. The bar to the right of each country indicates the level or percentage of risk. As you may notice, the percentages we're dealing with here are small, and this probability does reflect the rarity of mass killing onsets. Thankfully, new mass killing events don't occur frequently, but when they do, the consequences are significant. Countries listed in orange are the countries that are currently experiencing an ongoing mass killing. As you might be able to see, many countries do have ongoing episodes, so it's important to remember that the purpose of this assessment is to forecast the risk of a new mass killing, not the continuation or escalation of an ongoing one. And we do want to, in particular, draw people's attention to those countries where there is not an ongoing mass killing, because those are the places where we think that there ought to be the greatest opportunities for prevention. And that is not to say that these countries with ongoing episodes don't merit attention. The Simon Scott Center dedicates a significant amount of work to ending atrocities around the world. It's just a different type of question that what this model is designed to answer. So um, there are a few things to draw your attention to in this year's report to demonstrate how we think about these results and how we encourage others to use the results. A link to the report is shared in the chat. So when looking at the results, we highlight these four types of countries to pay especially close attention to. The highest risk countries. Obviously for any kind of ranking, you should look at the top of the list. This year, Pakistan, Yemen, and Burma top our list. And the sorts of questions to ask here are, are these countries receiving enough attention on the risks of mass atrocities? So not just are they in the news, but are people paying attention to the possibility that civilians could be targeted systematically? Um, and also what could trigger new violence against a group of civilians? And the same set of questions really should be applied to our consistently high risk groups. If a country ranks relatively high for multiple years running, we take this as a strong indication that the model is detecting real significant risks, not just a statistical anomaly. In our report, we highlight Afghanistan, India, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. The other thing here is that we think of this assessment as the beginning of a process of conversation and additional analysis. So it's important to think about what kinds of additional analysis could shed further light on the nature of atrocity risks. And then certainly when there's a significant shift in risk, as we've observed in three countries, Zimbabwe, Chad, and Turkey, we want to understand why there was a shift. And for those countries that increased in risk, what might lead to a continuing trend upwards. And then finally, the unexpected results are worth looking at. Uh, this category is a little bit more subjective, but these are the two countries where we thought experts might suspect that they should be higher in our rankings. So the Democratic Republic of the Congo and South Sudan. And the purpose of this analysis is not to pit qualitative analysts and statistical models against one another, but rather to deepen our understanding of risks in the country in question. Um, then finally, I just want to highlight that this is an example from our website. We have a page on each country where you can go find out more information about the specific risk factors and the trends over time. As mentioned earlier, all of the data are available if you want to download and explore, explore them yourself. And then so to close, we, what do we want you to do with this information? As we've heard from Representative Kim and Representative Jacobs, Congress plays a very important role in atrocity prevention. Congress can bring attention to specific countries at risk through public statements condemning violence against civilians. Um, it can also use its role in oversight and provision of resources to monitor the implementation of the Elie Wiesel Act to ensure foreign defense and development budgets reflect the risk level in key countries and regions. And it can, of course, always advance legislation prioritizing atrocity prevention. And for those of you who are working um, at or with executive agencies, at NGOs, at think tanks, as you're working with your colleagues to track these countries, share this information and have a conversation about it. Are they aware of the risks in these circumstances? If the results don't match your expectations, why might that be? 
what are your underlying assumptions and assessments of the current state and various potential futures? If large scale violence were to occur, what would it look like? What would the worst case scenario be? Who can take steps to prevent it at this point and what might those steps be? And to conclude, the bottom line is that the statistical risk assessment helps to identify countries that merit more attention, analysis, and potentially preventative action. Other kinds of analysis are necessary to help identify what exactly would be most effective at mitigating risks. So with that, I'll turn back to Andrea. And thank you, Ashley, for that uh, very helpful presentation. As a reminder to our audience, um, please leave any questions you have in the Q&A function at the bottom center of your screen, and we will address questions later in the program. It is now my honor to introduce Yvonne Mauerire, who is a visiting fellow at the Perry World House at the University of Pennsylvania and the Director of Education at Renew Democracy Initiative. Yvonne is a Zimbabwean clergyman who founded this flag citizens movement to challenge corruption, injustice, and poverty in Zimbabwe. The movement's main objective is to empower citizens to hold the government to account. The movement organized multiple successful nonviolent protests in response to unjust government policy. For his work, he was imprisoned and tortured in 2016, 2017, and 2019, and charged with treason facing 80 years in prison. He has received many awards and accolades, including from Foreign Policy Magazine, which named him among 100 global thinkers of 2016. Mawirire is currently a visiting 2022 fellow at both the University of Pennsylvania and at Johns Hopkins University. Ivan, I turn it over to you. Um, Andrea, thank you very much uh, for your introduction. And um, let me also convey my thanks to the Simon Scott Center for asking me to be a part uh, of this uh, conversation today. And of course, most importantly for uh, the uh, statistical uh, report that you have generated on countries at risk for mass killings. Um, thank you to the US um, Holocaust Memorial Museum as well for having me and for hosting us today. Um, I think being from Zimbabwe, our history as a nation lends itself to um, revealing um, the, the how much um, uh, the genocides or the killings that have happened there over the years um have have really needed uh, attention have really needed the world to know or have really needed um a way in which to stop or prevent uh, such kinds of things from happening in the future and when you look back on our history um starting with uh, uh you know well over 60 years ago in the liberation struggle that in itself entailed um a a, a mass killing on both sides of the war that was that was astronomical but notably after that when zimbabwe got independence under the leadership of robert mugabe zimbabwe entered a period between 1982 and 1987 where in the south of the country uh, an estimated 20,000 people of the ndebele tribe were murdered uh, by the fifth Brig brigade um, army unit of the zimbabwe uh, military which was trained in north korea and this was a systematic killing of people by Robert Mugabe, the dictator at the time, uh, in an attempt to protect his hold uh, on power. This continued in Zimbabwe uh, going on between uh, the, the, the periods of 2000, run right about the late 1990s, I should say, but notably 2000 until 2008, where again, political violence um, contributed to the killing of thousands of people across the country. This again has begun to happen between the period of 2016 to present day. And, and when I saw the report, I could see how accurate it was in terms of the significant, significant shift. It didn't surprise me at all in terms of a country that is at risk of mass killing. The first, uh, uh, and, and I think most important thing to understand, particularly with Zimbabwe, is that again, it is politically uh, motivated. But I think what is more notable is that since Robert Mugabe, who is now late, was removed from power in 2017, the military took over, the same military that was uh, uh, at the forefront under Robert Mugabe's leadership in the 1980s uh, when they killed people in the south of the country, that same military is who took over. And in fact, 
the man who is now president in Zimbabwe is a man who was the minister of state security in the 1980s and the one who led the mass killings and he's now president today and so the 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 flaring of the instances of uh, brutal violence and and uh, abductions and beatings and killings has again resurfaced in an attempt to hold and protect power in Zimbabwe a young lady was murdered uh, about a year ago just in fact yeah about a year ago a young lady was murdered in Zimbabwe because of her political position uh, you have already begun to have many people that are being abducted and being beaten in their homes for their for their political uh, you know alignments um in the early 80s, one of the groups that led a campaign that is similar to what the Simon Scott Center is doing was actually the Catholic Church. And through the Catholic Commission for uh, uh, Peace and Justice, they were the only ones who began to sound the alarm. And there were very few ears that listened, but also there was very, there was very little data that was available, very little pointed to what was being done. Uh, you know, during that time. And of course, uh, today the world knows through the reports and the recordings of the Catholic Commission for uh, 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 Justice and Peace, just how many people were murdered, the kind of uh, atrocities that took place. And so this is a very important report for Zimbabwe. It's a very important report for many countries around the world. Because if we don't have these early warning signs, then we, we have to put ourselves in a position where like the Holocaust, like in Rwanda, uh, we have to then start to, you know, to commit ourselves to never again. But how do, we, how do we prevent getting to a place where we say, where we say never again? How do we get to a place where we say we were able to stop it before it happened? And so I'm thankful for this opportunity to spotlight Zimbabwe uh, and of course, to speak into um, uh, this, this global, global work really th that is going to benefit, uh, benefit all of us. So thank you for having me here today. Thank you so much, Ivan. And um, I appreciate your remarks and um, uh, certainly speaking about the situation in Zimbabwe to show what this information that Ashley presented, what the data from the statistical risk assessment really means, what policymakers can do with that, and the real human impact that effective action can have. I would now like to introduce the final member of our panel today, Anne Richard. Anne Richard is a distinguished fellow at Freedom House. Previously, she served as Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration in the Obama administration. Prior to joining the Obama administration, Ms. Richard was the Vice President of Government Relations and Advocacy for the International Rescue Committee. Earlier in her career, she served in other senior positions at the State Department, at Peace Corps headquarters, and at the U.S. Office of Management and Budget. I turn it over to you, Anne. Thank you very much, Andrea. And um, I am so pleased to be part of this and to have been asked to be part of this. And I want to thank the Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Simon Scott Center, the early warning project specifically, and of course our friends at uh, Dartmouth as well, especially uh, Tori Newland. I mean, Tori Holt, what am I saying, Tori Holt? Um, I, I would like to um, make the case that this is a very useful tool uh, for government policymakers and diplomats and planners and analysts. And to speak about uh, the usefulness for this uh, as someone who is a former Assistant Secretary of State, and then I wanna make a few observations about the country that I'm working the most on right now, which is Afghanistan, where at Freedom House, we are running a project called the Afghanistan Human Rights Coordination Mechanism. And we're running that with some fellow uh, non-governmental organizations and uh, many, many uh, Afghan human rights uh, defenders. And so um, without, without taking too long then, let me um, focus first on um, my experience in government where what I found was the top level people were too busy responding to too many active crises in recent years. And um, the decision about which countries to focus on often was driven by media reports, which could not be scheduled or known about in advance necessarily, uh, that the press drove coverage and attention or the explosion of crises when it's too late to prevent them drove coverage and attention. We all know that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. As someone who worked on aid budgets, it's definitely true that it's cheaper to prevent a crisis than to respond later on. Uh, but despite knowing that, we used to always make the mistake 
of ignoring the potential for bad things to happen instead be uh, react uh, to to bad things happening. So the uh, I'm very appreciative that the atrocity prevention board created at the Obama administration and now uh, called the atrocity prevention task force that Ann Witkowski was talking about carves out the opportunity for focusing attention and serious discussion on um, these set of countries that have the potential to have mass uh, killing. I can remember in my career, this didn't always happen. I remember in 1996 going to a lot of meetings about Burundi. Why? because Rwanda had happened in April of 1994. And so now people wanted to prevent mass killing in Burundi, but this was obviously driven by a lot of guilt and regret over not taking action earlier uh, on its neighbor country. I think that um, what this tool allows is, um, like I say, to carve out time uh, in Washington to look at these issues in an interagent, uh, interagency fashion. But I also think it gives then ambassadors and embassies the excuse they might need to devote time and attention to analyzing what's happening inside their own countries um, and to ju justify higher level attention to what they're doing. I thought it was very interesting that our members of Congress appearing today see this tool as very useful to them as well because they can um, call for hearings, ask questions, um, make uh, trips, uh, and, and, and organize then their work around the evidence that is collected for them uh, through this tool. And I think that also another way to handle the, the overwhelming amount uh, of crises around the world that are calling out for attention or potential crises is to take multilateral approaches. Uh, these are not always um, well regarded by every politician in Washington, but I think um, presidents and others in the White House know that um, you know by sharing responsibilities and pulling in uh, like-minded uh, other countries, other experts, uh, this is a way to really extend uh, the amount of work being done to prevent uh, mass killing. And this can also be done by groups of interested countries that share similar interests. So it can be done formally through multilateral organizations or informally. Um, I myself, I remember taking a trip to um, Central Africa, accompanied by the UN, uh, a UN official and the EU humanitarian coordinator. And the three of us when, um, trying to bring more attention to what was happening around Lake Chad and the threat of Boko Haram and doing this then uh, instead of you know three <laughs> separate trips, but doing it united and uh, really trying to have common messages, which I thought was uh, a very smart thing, and I recommend more of that being done. Um, so I would like to then turn to talk about my current work on Afghanistan, where I'm working with human rights defenders, who many of whom are still inside Afghanistan and some of whom have now fled into exile. You know, Afghanistan is another example, like uh, country number 11, Syria, or number three, uh, Burma, Myanmar, uh, where uh, US or Western wishful thinking has uh, taken place, where we look and see hopeful things on the horizon because we want to see them. We don't want bad outcomes. I think this was the case also of South Sudan a few years ago, where it uh, erupted in violence after its independence, but we didn't really want that to be the story. Um, so I think the hope for peace does not necessarily produce peace, uh, that many in the US government are overly optimistic and not cool headed analysts because they want to, we want to claim uh, credit for success. We want to be successful in our own careers. We want to be um, successful administrations. And this is where uh, Simon Scott Center's efforts uh, can be very straightforward, can be more hard, headed, uh, cool headed, if you will, um, and look at the at the facts. 
Uh, in terms of Afghanistan, you'll see that it's given country rank number seven, that it's been in the top 10 for some time. Um, the very good capsule summary uh, that's available that talks about what's happening in Afghanistan right now does um, capture a country in transition uh, because of the um, Taliban takeover in August of 2021. Um, there's a focus that I think many of us um, agree should be there on the um, attacks against my ethnic and religious minorities. Um, many of these attacks against the Hazara and other minority Sufis and Sikh minorities um, were carried out by ISIS-K, uh, the Islamic State of Khorasan province. And uh, while this is not the Taliban necessarily launching these attacks, it is tolerating these attacks. And as the de facto government does have the responsibility to prevent these things from happening, to protect the citizens of the country. And so they are failing to do that every time there are large numbers of civilians uh, killed who are, are um, killed because of their membership in ethnic or religious minorities. The group that I'm working closely with is also mentioned here, the Taliban continues to commit targeted abuses against the perceived opposition, human rights defenders, journalists, and also the LGBTQI plus community. Um, and so um, when we're talking about mass killing, the numbers um, may in fact be underreported inside Afghanistan as we see one by one, uh, human rights champions, protesters are arrested um, and then not heard from for a while. And then a family might be called and told to come pick up their bodies. And so there is a great deal of danger for people who um, have worked on these issues in the past, are known for working on these issues, or who have the courage to speak up now, given how dangerous it is. Um, finally, the world is paying more attention to the fate of women in Afghanistan, which is completely appropriate, given uh, that women and girls uh, are um, very much vulnerable right now to attack as their rights are stripped away from them and as they are um, sort of imprisoned in their homes. Uh, so the the rights basis of uh that 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 citizens deserve in a country from their government is really the the point that we are trying to push um and of course the taliban is not at all interested in in these points <laughs> um but i think as an international community uh, this is um a message that dovetails with the important analysis that is being carried out by um uh, your folks. The, the, the final comment here that the Taliban, uh, if the Taliban commits mass killing while in control of the government, we would consider it a new state-led mass killing, so a different category than um, the non-state-led episodes in the past. Um, and my, my final point, I think, is for someone who worked on refugees, uh, that the analysis that you've done also shows how dangerous the neighborhood is that surrounds Afghanistan. People who flee across borders to South Asia, to Central Asia, to Iran, don't necessarily find safety. And that this is a, a broader problem than, than uh, just what's happening inside Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for those remarks. Um, it's really helpful to, to know how this, um, how the data, how early warning applies to these real world situations. Uh, we have received many, many questions. I will um, pose as many as I can with the, the time we have remaining, so less than 15 minutes. And I'm going to categorize some of the similar questions together. So the first question I would like to pose, and this is to, to all panelists, um, uh, someone had uh, submitted a question specific to Iraq about um, Iraq having experienced multiple genocides over many decades. A general question, I think, is what does impunity for past genocides or past mass atrocities mean for the future risk 
of mass atrocities. And I turn it over to any speaker. Maybe let me um, come in here, I, I, you know, Andrea. I think this is probably one of the um, uh, one of the lessons that must be learned about uh, math killings from uh, from the past is that unless there is a robust system of accountability, unless people are held accountable, because we're talking about people's lives here that have been taken in mass. And unless there is a robust system that enforces accountability and that follows up accountability, this will happen again. As in the case of Zimbabwe, uh, where I'm from, this has played out over years. And as your report shows, there is an increased, uh, increased risk that this may happen again. And the same people that perpetrated the, the genocide in the past are the same people that are beginning to activate it now. And so unless we, 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 we are, um, kind of, you know, show or unless, uh, you know, together we, we, uh, follow up and and there is there is a, a a definitive way of dealing with those that have been involved in mass killings and atrocities they'll do it again the more people feel that people in power feel that they can get away with it the more they are empowered to do it again so i think that has played a huge role and going forward as we look at the risk uh, or, or as we look at areas that are places that are at risk for mass killings i think mechanisms uh, to also hold people accountable should be put in place at the same time so that they kick in not after the fact, but even before it begins to happen, uh, you know, as well. I believe that can be a really good way of prevention. Thank you. I invite other panelists who want to weigh in on this question as well. Uh, yes, just to say very much agree with what Yvonne said. We know from the literature, from the research, that genocide mass atrocities are cyclical in nature. So when we don't address these sorts of grievances that populations have when affected communities aren't able to achieve justice, we know that that can heighten the risks um, for future uh, atrocities. Um, and just speaking from the sort of quantitative um, modeling perspective, you know, countries with a history of mass killing, it puts them at more risk for a future mass killing. So the further we can get away, the better we can address um, grievances and address accountability, um, the better for that country in conflict. I've been uh, impressed by organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross that has as one of its responsibilities uh, teaching about the uh, laws of war, uh, which really is uh, about preventing um, uh, atrocities during wartime. Uh, it may sound like uh, um, that that uh, doesn't make sense, but it, it it is uh, pursuing create a, a spreading a better understanding of the Geneva Convention and um, the the ways to protect civilians uh, and non-combatants and prisoners of war and so I think similarly you know teaching whenever we can about human rights uh, about the need uh, to hold um, killers accountable is is something that should be done and is worth investing in so that there are people who stop and question what might be about to happen um, and understand that there are international standards uh, that uh, oppose uh, mass killing. Thank you. Great, thank you. Can, can I just can I just come back in on this and this Andrea real quick? I, I think another thing that bears uh, attention is that what often gets in the way, in my view, uh, and again, as in the case of Zimbabwe, and I think many other places across the world, what often gets in the way of being able to implement these accountability measures or these measures of being able to uh, deal with atrocities that have happened in the past and to stop them from happening right now, sometimes is the political interest uh, that nations have in a region or in a nation. And, and I have to say this because I think 
it is it is what is difficult to get around is that when when there is a, a, a political interest or political agenda, there seems to be a willingness to overlook or to whitewash over some of these incidences. In the early 80s in Zimbabwe, it was very clear that the British government knew what was going on in the south of the country, but did not say anything because they were really wanting to have this uh, you know, new dispensation of Robert Mugabe take off without, quote unquote, without a glitch, but it did have that glitch. So I think there also needs to be a way in which we, we nations that have political interest in certain parts of the world um, I understand that that political interest and its protection and its promotion is is is, is, some, is, is in many cases what overshadows the the uh, very important work of preventing uh, you know what is happening or the very important work of holding to account the people that are involved in these in these mass killings. Right, and thank you. Um, we have, we've received many questions um, on a similar theme, so I'm, I'm summarizing them here. These are more directed for Ashley about the early warning project and specifically the statistical risk assessment. But we've received several questions regarding how countries without ongoing mass killings can rank above countries um, uh, that, that aren't, um, are, are, I'm sorry, how, how countries without current mass killings can rank before countries that are currently experiencing mass atrocities. So can you explain why that is the case? And then similarly, there have been questions regarding why the assessment uh, forecasts only new onsets of mass killing rather than continuing or escalating um, current, uh, current cases. If you could address those questions, please. Yes, happy to. Those are really great questions. Um, so yes, of course, as you've heard me talk about, the real, the purpose of this assessment is to forecast new onsets, so not continuation or ongoing. Um, but what you will see is if you actually look at the top 15, um, say, most at-risk countries, you will see that many of them do actually have ongoing um, mass killing episodes. So they are represented sort of in our high-risk group of top 30. Um, but because the purpose, obviously, for this assessment is um, a new onset, you might get countries, of course, that, you know, don't necessarily have an onset of mass, or don't have an ongoing episode of mass killing ranking above those countries. Um, so as a first point, um, it's statistically rare for a country to actually have multiple episodes of mass killing. So this is what the model says, this is the data, that it is statistically rare. Um, we do have countries that are experiencing multiple cases or multiple ongoing mass killings, but just as a point, um, it is rare for that to happen. So of course, that's definitely one explanation. Um, if a country already has an ongoing episode of mass killing, it's going to decrease its risk in some ways um, for it, the, the likelihood of a, a new onset. And, and some of that has to do, of course, if you think about the broadness of, say, the group that is being targeted. Um, so obviously, if you take an example like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the um, ongoing episode that's going on right now is non-state groups um, attacking civilians um, in Eastern DRC. And the ter the group, the definition or the scope of who is being targeted is so broad that um, it encompasses a lot, encompasses a lot of groups. So it's unlikely, um, you know, especially in the Eastern DRC, that a new group will perpetrate a specific group of civilians because it's already being captured in that ongoing episode. And then very much on a related no note to that second part of the question, why do we focus on new onsets of mass killing? A um, couple of reasons here. This is obviously what we are able at this point, what this model is able to forecast reliably. Um, there are other great organizations and models out there their ACLID um, and Uppsala University's data where they're doing potentially more sort of real time looking at conflict, you know, in uh, short periods of time. And, the, and those are great um, to really assess sort of ongoing dynamics in a country. But what we're doing is really focused on early warning. So we want to obviously see how early on we can alert and sound the alarm that a mass killing might occur. And of course, before it's done. So that would be why we would want to focus um, on an onset 
rather than um, continuation or ongoing. But th that's definitely um, a sort of a goal that we are continually and actively working on to see if we can include that, build out our measure in uh, greater force that it could do those shorter term assessments or maybe build an, a, another model. So it's definitely something that's always on our mind. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And we have a question. This is a question geared for Anne. Um, so this question is about, um, you know, there have been some, some recent successes and a lot of effort regarding atrocity prevention. Um, and yet um, uh, this question states that there was you know, little to no prevention done on uh, the situation in, in Ethiopia. And as um, Ashley just alluded to, you know, civilians continue to be killed in DRC. Um, what is the bottom line problem? What, what can the U.S. government do um, in order to do a better job at prevention and to have an earlier and more effective response? I think that the idea of um, sharing responsibilities with other governments, staying very closely aligned with them, staying engaged, um, is is the way to go. Uh, if you know you can't expect the Secretary of State or the National Security Advisor to follow every single country on a daily basis, but you can take a team approach within the U.S. government. You can expand that team to include. Um, colleagues from other countries to do more uh, together. Uh, so, so, you know, I've spent a lot in my career trying to bring people's attention to, um, you know, ominous situations. And so I know how hard that is, um, but I think this, this type of uh, rational analysis can really be helped to break through uh, the tendency of bureaucrats to look back on the last situation that they dealt with and not at what's happening right now, what might happen in the future. Thank you. And I know we, we are at time. Um, are there any uh, brief and closing remarks from any of our speakers? Um, anything that you would just, just like to add before we close the program? Um, just to, I think, highlight the importance of uh, these kinds of reports, uh, but more importantly, that they can find their ways into the hands of uh, those that, um, that are on the ground. Often um, uh, reports of these warnings are generated and uh, people that are on the ground who are either at risk or who can at least begin to put in place mechanisms to, to stop these things from happening are unaware of what's happening. And, um, and and so I, I think that uh, this is going to be, for me, at least one of those uh, important things to see how best we can get this information into the hands of people that are on the ground in Zimbabwe or in, 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 in other places to study these reports and look at their own situations uh, and see how best that they can they can they can derive, uh, you know, uh, the, the best benefit of uh, producing the report, but to thank you for, for taking the time to produce it and to have it uh, launched and presented. Thank you again. Based on the, uh, many of the questions that have come in, I think that this is a work in progress, you know, this, this type of effort. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of ways you can criticize this or that aspect. But the very fact that the exercise is being done and that we are calling attention to it and we are doing this not, uh, the Simon Scott uh, Center is doing this not in a closed room, but in a transparent way and, and opening this up to others is, is an excellent uh, move. So I salute you for doing that. Yes. And I, I just want to say, I mean, thanks, um, Yvonne and Evan, um, your comments have been so great. And what I will say is the second component of the early warning project are our qualitative deep country um, reports. And I believe Yvonne mentioned, you know, one of the ones we did for Zimbabwe. Um, but these are sort of the, the next step, you know, our tool is wonderful at, you know, sorting the world by categories of risk, but then taking this additional step where you do a deep dive into a specific situation 
and country and really go back and assess the, the risk factors, what the most plausible scenarios could be and recommendations. Um, so we'd encourage you to look at our deep dive country reports and encourage others to do similar um, work. I know for Anne, it would be you know useful. I'm sure she's using it for her work in Afghanistan and then Ivan as well. It, always thinking about that sort of stuff um, for Zimbabwe, for other countries um, as well. And the United States government just in the last few months released a new atrocity um, prevention framework um, assessment that's really great as a sort of a template to use. But that's all. Thank you so much. I'll hand it back to Andrea. Thank you. Um, and just to briefly close on the, the theme that I think all, all the panelists have shared that the reason we have a tool like this is because we want you know, policymakers to use it. And I reflect upon a, a comment that was shared by um, El Munzer, a Holocaust survivor and volunteer here at the museum, um, who has said that, you know, in addition to alerting governments and you know, multilateral or organizations, hopefully we will alert the media and civil society to this risk too. And I think that's important, something that we want to see at the Simon Scott Center, not only effective responses from policymakers, but a, an engaged public that is very concerned about communities at risk around the world. And this is one small step to that, that greater goal. Um, thank you to all of our esteemed speakers for joining us today and for the audience um, for this, this rich discussion. Um, thank you to the museum staff who helped pull this together and make this event possible. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us with additional questions about the risk assessment or for more information about the work of the Simon Scott Center. So in the program for today, thank you all again. <laughs>